Hey ladies and gentle boys, Spazzy here aka Syndromes and welcome back to episode number 3 of our Memories of Discovery. That rhymed. The year is 2009 and it will be a very eventful time for little Spazzy. This was the year that gave us the final release version of 85, it's uh, full removal of all the imports, rip spatial, uh, Gallia and its invasion of the Taos, and also the introduction of Ethel Hook Command, such as the Rename Me, Give Cash and all the other ones. These changes rekindled many players' interest in Disco and brought us a lot of new blood. And so, as the server population was hitting peak numbers, many of us, myself included, used that as a chance to spread our wings a little bit and make new characters now that it was a lot easier to do so. In terms of my timeline, this would be the mark of the point where I returned to Liberty after spending more than a year playing an Outcast ID. In truth, this year would be what I think is my first Golden Age of Disco, which lasted until 2011. Until the incident. The first incident. We'll get to that. Many of you already know that in the end, it would be the Liberty Rogues that became my main faction and my first experience as a second in command and later on, a leader. But before we talk about the rogues, there is still a gap that I want to address that exists in parallel with my time with the outcasts, and that is my experience with the nomads. In the previous episode, I mentioned how I had accepted at the time the fact that Disco was roleplay light. The in-game environment didn't really offer much in terms of writing quality, and due to the PP-centric nature of the region that I was in, that assumption did not really change for a while. That is, until I started encountering the Nomad players, then flying the Keeper tag. Well, okay, that's not completely fair. We had quite a few Outcast factions as well at the time. We had the 101st, the SOB, the BL, the Ross, and frankly, I always thought that Ross and 101st had to have the best writing players. But Nomads back in the day were completely something else. Their recruitment didn't really change for years, but essentially, you actually had to create a trial nomad ship and fly with the members of the faction to give your best roleplay to them so that you could be vouched for. It was an incredibly good filtering tool. And of course, when it came to their encounters with other human players, it was usually very PvP-centric, except for the outcasts. Now, for those of you who are not aware, canonically, the outcasts would bury some of their dead by sending them into the gas field that hides the jump hole to Omicron 90, the original ping system. It is the same jump hole around which you'll find the outcast quote, Graveyard, a place filled with sabers. This made some of the outcasts look at nomads as sort of guardian spirits, which meant that while it was perhaps a little bit too generous to call it neutrality per se, the nomads were far less inclined to shoot you if you were flying an outcast ID. There's, and then there's Nomspeak, their unique writing style. It was kind of, it was kind of cringe actually, but in a good way. I remember talking to Yuri at the time and he said how it was modeled on the speech pattern made by Sovereign from Mass Effect and also the Rachni species of the same game. And uh, yeah, it really worked, it was unique to say the least. The fact that Outcasts did not shoot nomads on sight meant that Alpha was one of those places that you find a Keeper in their more talkative moods, rather than just flying around looking something to shoot. And needless to say, the fact that they were, by rules of the faction, forbidden of any out-of-roleplay communication with non-nomad players made them very fun because of that unknown aspect. But why am I bringing up the recruitment? Well, nomads were not just about shooting people, so they had to have their nomad trial members interact with other human characters to see how they would do. Alpha, for the reason that I mentioned above, was a relatively safe place for trial nomads, to do just that without it leading to BP situations, all underneath the watchful eyes of the Keepers present at the time. And that is kind of how I ended up befriending them. Or at least, me being around Alpha all the time just made me a very good target to practice on, right? To the point where, over time, I just started to fly with them as my character was more or less indoctrinated roleplay-wise, and that led to the creation of Arthur Degar, my first and only SRP character. But until then, I was often referenced as a sort of first contact for Bonnaby nomads who wanted to practice their roleplay with humans. I very distinctly remember chilling next to Harby as a human character, and honestly, it still kind of feels like uh, my character was a, like an adopted puppy or something. Good times. Now, the story of this character 
and herein lies a very personal turning point. At this point in time, I realized the disco had an actual roleplay quality to it that I had not experienced yet, and so I started treating it like the forums and the chats of my previous roleplay experiences. This would be the turning point where my first character, my Merc Syndrome's character, became Arthur Degar, the character that I would be later turning into a SRP. The difference between the two is very simple. It was the point where I stopped roleplaying the character as myself and instead made an actual character out of it with their own motivations, their goals, their quirks, their own personality, etc. And the thing that made Degar special was the fact that he was the first non-infested human character to befriend the nomads. Though, understandably, befriend is a very strong term. He was tolerated, he was useful, right? Again, the character was supposed to be flawed. This is a character, a human character, that was so disillusioned by humanity that when he saw the inhuman nature of the nomads, he, in a very misinformed way by the way, uh, put them on a pedestal above humanity, that they were somehow better because they lacked the infighting and the treacherous nature of his fellow man. He genuinely, foolishly, thought that the nomads were above humanity in a way that made even the outcasts, the ones who tolerated nomads, to question Degar's choices, and so, eventually, as a part of Degar's roleplay and, you know, evolution, he became the first non-nomad, non-wild character on the server that was allowed to dock on nomad and wild bases, while in return, he lost rights to dock on any other human bases, he became hostile to everything else, and even became neutral no-dock to the outcasts. Of course, a lot of the character's roleplay specifics I'm not going to mention in detail, for example, I had a project that involved ship infestation rather than human infestation. It would be kind of like a method to allow Degar to more or less perceive the mindshare of the nomads with some limited degree without having his brain blow up in the process. And uh, up until then, a nomad played by another player uh, by the name of Sil would act as their sort of proxy, as a sort of translator between him and the mindshare. Of course, at that point in time, I actually did join the Keepers, since the whole landing on Nomad bases was a big deal SRP-wise. I had to be made accountable for it, and I had to have a Nomad character. Funnily enough, this would actually be the reason why I started playing the single-player campaign for the first time in my life. I just had to know the, you know, the nature of the Nomad lore. And one of the things that stuck out for me during this whole experience was that the evolution of this character was not pre-written, it was not planned. It was a character with minimal to no roleplay presence on the forum and any out of roleplay contacts, apart from the ones that I described above. One of the first mentions of it on the forum was actually from a Corsair spy, a player posing as a freelancer in Alpha who had seen my interaction with the Nomads and reported it back in roleplay to the Corsair High Council, making them very aware of Degar and his antics. More than 10 years later now, it is hard for me to recall the details as to why the character faded in activity over time. My desire to do new things and new projects no doubt plays a non-insignificant role in that, but it was also most likely because the person with whom I did a lot of that Nomad-related roleplay retired from Disco around that time. All of this was also happening in parallel to my time in the Liberty Rogues, where I was quickly rising through the ranks until I found myself being an underboss, the second-in-command, and so my focus shifted away from the Omicrons. Eventually, the character was conserved and placed on a pedestal, so to speak. The ship itself, as well as the roleplay IP and the infested ship concept, was given over to the Keepers. Though I did keep my Nomad ship and I did re remain in the Keepers, Zalctis, my Nomad, will be name-dropped in later videos, no doubt. But overall, I think that the Nomad's Degar was my first truly elaborate experience in Disco in terms of roleplay depth. My first and only SRP to date, and I still think that it was something unique for its time. Of course, the Oracles came around later and they did something very similar to this, but that's another story altogether. Now, of course, this did not mean a end to my Omicron fun times. When Merc Syndromes became Arthur Degar, I still needed a just a regular outcast ship for less roleplay-centric outcast fun stuff. 
And so a new character was made called Lick a Brick. A proper outcast gunship because we finally got a gunship of our own. You'll see a lot of that later when we enter the 2010s. But now let's end this video. After all, this was a brief peek back into what we left behind. But now join me as we travel back to the place of my original exile, Liberty in the 2009s and 10s, where we will look at the Liberty Rogues, Andrew Mort, and the beginnings of the Liberty Rogue Torpedoes, and the concept of the losing is fun approach. This was Spazzy, aka Syndromes. Fly safe.